there so that you can write down some questions. And then I'm going to ask you, after you write them down, to pass them to the stage right, my left, to your right, and the aisle. And the urchin will come out and pick those up. We'll give you a few minutes to write the uh, questions down. Then we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, we'll start off first with Ms. Amina Matthews. And I won't go through all of the, the information about them. You have the program too to get that information so that we'll be brief on time. But she is one of the interrupters, and as you saw her in the movie. And next uh, to her, a good friend, Eddie, Eddie Bob. Bacadero. Yes, and you saw him also in the film. Then Dr. Wilkerson, and you see the information with her. And then the co-producer, Zach Piper, on the end, you have this information there also. And then we had special guests come in that we didn't expect to come in at first, and he's been to Columbus a few times, and he surprised us to come on in. And that is the founder and executive director of Ceasefire, Dr. Gary Slutton. in the program, but he's a professor of epidemiology and, and the International Health of the University of Illinois of Chicago School of Public Health. He has fought tuberculosis in San Francisco, cholera and tuberculosis epidemics among refugees in Somalia, and AIDS in Uganda and Thailand through the World Health Organization Global Program on AIDS. In 1995, Dr. Slutkin returned to the U.S. to work on what he now recognized as an epidemic of violence. Since then, he has been working with Chicago leaders, clergy, community, and law enforcement to develop and implement a new strategy for violence reduction through behavior change and disease control. And that's what you saw this evening, the ceasefire program. So we're going to start off while you are writing down your questions. And why don't we start with Dr. Slechter? And could you talk a little bit about your thoughts uh, and why you created this program and implemented this program in Chicago. How's everybody tonight? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, thanks for coming out to see the film. Um, as you know, we didn't make the film, we're subjects of the film. Kurt Templin and Zach made this film. Uh, I wanted to I just say a couple of things first. Um, where's David Wilhelm? David Wilhelm, our board member of our, is here, one of our NAF, lives in Columbus, the board member of Ceasefire NAF. At the vice chair, and, and I also want to point out that uh, Deanna Wilkerson is really the reason why I'm here tonight. Um, the, um, I'm not ordinarily uh, with the film most of the time. Uh, the film is in dozens of cities, and we're not always with it in, the, um, in doing these questions and answers. And the reason that we're here tonight is really because of Columbus, Ohio itself and uh, the importance of um, this problem, I know, to you, and um, our desire to work with uh, the city of Columbus, and with Deanna, and with um, uh, the mayor, um, to help um, bring ceasefire fully into um, your city. And I know that uh, Deanna and Ohio State have been working for about three and a half years to get all the pieces together. And we're uh, very much committed to uh, helping uh, you do that. And if um, we are lucky enough, and you are lucky enough for us to develop this partnership, you can expect to see less of the shootings and killings than are occurring now. Uh, with uh, respect to uh, your question, Jerry, they, they, just very simply, um, I'm asked, you know, how did we? Uh, figure out to um, approach this problem in a different way. And it simply just comes from um, that I have a different background. My background is controlling diseases and doing behavior change. And when I returned to this country um, 15 years ago, and people began to tell me about this problem, and I asked them what we were doing about it, um, the things that people were telling me didn't make very much sense. And in fact, were um, largely counterproductive. <laughs> things like punishment, um, but also looking for very um, non-specific uh, ideas. So it, it took us about five years to figure it out, and then we put uh, this strategy into West Garfield Park, the worst police district 
in the United States at the time. We got a 67% drop in shootings and killings. People said, do it again. Uh, let me, let's see you do it again. We've now replicated this 18 times in Chicago, about uh, three times in Baltimore. We're working in 15 cities around the United States, including New York City, Baltimore, Kansas City, Oakland, New Orleans, um, planning with Detroit, and hopefully we'll be working with um, Columbus as well. So the, the idea here is that this problem is not a problem of bad people, it's a problem of learned, acquired behavior. People model each other, and we can interrupt its spread. That's what um, Amina and Eddie and Kobe, and in Chicago there's 50 interrupters and 50 outreach workers um, doing this work, and then we can work on the behavior change. You can see how um, Flamo has actually changed, same for Mikey and many others, dozens of others. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Zach, I wanted to ask, because when I first saw the film, I was wondering, uh, I'm sitting there and I'm seeing that folks, Amina and Eddie now, they're getting right up in folks' face, right? At, at the height of uh, when people are very angry, seem to be out of control, and I'm watching the video and I'm seeing great shots and all, and I was wondering, would folks stop you and say, hey, you know, get this out, get the camera out of here. How'd you do that? How'd you decide, decide what shots to do? Or did you run into those kind of problems or anything like that? Did you? Surprisingly, we didn't run into that too often, but occasionally we'd run into people who didn't want to be filmed or who wanted their faces blurred out. But really, it was a process to get access like we were able to get for this film. And it was a process where, you know, we first were able to get in uh, because of the story that Alice Collins had done for the New York Times Magazine, and so he was uh, really familiar with Dr. Sluck, and also Tito Hardiman, uh, who you see in the film, was really pushing this idea that, um, you know, we're working on this film, and you know, get these guys out there, you know, if there's something, comes, uh, something pops off, to call the filmmakers. So it took a while, in Amina's case, it took a long while, but eventually we made it, and we, uh, we built, we developed a relationship with them where they trusted us. Um, we sort of put some power and control in their hands. So that it was important to us that no matter, we wanted to film as much as we could, but we also did, did not want to undermine the work. So um, they had the power to tell us to walk away, not to film this. But generally, because uh, people have so much respect for Amina, and Eddie, and Kobe, that they would allow us, it was, it was like, because they saw that they were cool with us, um, the people we came across, so we just took their lead. Yeah, great shots, great great, great. Um, I'm going to remind you to write your uh, questions down if you pass them over to the uh, right side, to your right side, and we'll have uh, ushers to come down and pick up the questions there if we can do that so we can move along. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Amina and Eddie, um, in general, whichever one of you like to go with this. Uh, when I was looking up the information about ceasefire, of course, you know, you look at the, the rate and the homicide rate and the reduction and all, but just from a street level in terms of what your perception of what was going on in the community, what was the difference that you saw before ceasefire and after ceasefire was implemented? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, for me personally, uh, being out there in the streets and doing the things that that uh, that I was raised to do, as far as um, not understanding, I I too was was part of the youth that didn't think that I was going to make it past 21, and um, and when I started in working, well, when I volunteered, well, actually I didn't volunteer. I was asked to help on a couple of mediations. And uh, it really was about helping someone save their lives. You know, a mother called T.O. T.O. called one of the other violence interrupters that was there uh, working. And he called, and it was one of the guys that I was hustling with back in the day. So he called and asked me could I help him with this potential homicide that was going to, this conflict that was going to end up in a homicide. And I said, sure. And it was maybe two of those that I helped him with, and then he invited me to come down to the table um, and, and, and introduce me to Tito, and introduce me to Dr. Suckham, and introduce me to the guys at the table, and, 
and to listen to Gary speak about the concept of, you know, violence is like an epidemic. Um, you know, I, I didn't never, I never looked at it in that way because we were raised that if someone hit you, you have to defend yourself and, and hit back. You know, um, so then I had to look at it in another level on if someone hits you or disagrees or, you know, step outside of that boundary, do they deserve to die, you know, to resolve that conflict or, you know, so no, they don't deserve to die. So after a couple of mediations and, and, and I got bitten by the ceasefire bug, as Eddie was saying, you know, I call it the ceasefire bug that you know, to buy into the campaign that no one um, needs to die out there to resolve a conflict. So before ceasefire, I really didn't understand his analogy of that it's like an epidemic and it spreads. And, and after I sat back and got into the, the academics of working for ceasefire and looking at it in a different way and also changing my mindset on things that you know, how we're trying to get these guys and girls to change their mindset on looking at things uh, in, in a different way on resolving a conflict. So to me, it's, it's a lot better um, after ceasefire because I also can um, think about and, and talking to these guys and girls and talking them down from that 30 seconds of rage, you know, de-escalating them, opposed to justifying with them that, you know what, true, you do need to uh, go get the guys and get the guns, and no, you don't need to do that. You need to, you know, change your mindset on it. So, uh, being bit by the ceasefire bug, um, it's been good. <laughs> it's, been, it's been all good for me. Eddie, what about you? I noticed the change in the community. It's like you guys would go around, people already knew about you. So that must have been a big difference. You guys built a reputation during that time. So how does that feel in that process? You've been involved for two years, and then you five years. Five years, yes. Well, it was different. I mean, I mean initially the reputation that I had in the street was, you know, you know as a game man, you know as someone who used to take care of that business, but you fed into this, this, uh, this norm of violence, which is what we're you know, up against and what we're trying to change. And then uh, through my process of incarceration, you know, looking at things from a different perspective, you know, more of a, from a sociological perspective, you know, was being introduced to textbooks and, and trying to educate myself. Uh, I realized that you know, the issues that were out there were plaguing the community. I would look around me and I wouldn't see inmates that came from, you know, from upper class communities, you know, when I looked up around me, was, I saw people who had, you know, mental health issues, who came from broken down homes, as, as I did, and, and some as my peers did. Uh, and so coming home, I, I went in there with a different set, and I already had these goals in my mind, like, you know, so that I come out, you know, I want to go to school, so I registered in college. Uh, I wanted to volunteer, especially in, in my case where I knew I had a felony, and it's not just a felony, but it was a murder felony. So the, the opportunities were very, very slim for me. Uh, so I knew that I somehow I had to balance this, you know, find some type of balance and, and find opportunity. And it's something that if it wasn't for ceasefire, I would, I, I would necessarily know what I'd be doing right now. Um, but as a result of that, you know, I'm able to make, you know, try at least, uh, and, and make changes in people's lives, you know, trying to steer them in the right direction. And, uh, and I'm reminded of myself every time that I work with some of these youth, you know, this, this was you, you know, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Um, so it, it's been a great opportunity for me. Let's take a question from the audience. It says, what is the best way for someone without a background in engagement with street violence to help outside of academia? And I know that it, being involved there is training involved also, so I want to make sure that people don't think you know you have a heart for you just up and out, out into the community and doing this work. I want to make sure we're clear about that. There is some training that's involved. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, what's the best way for someone to get involved? Uh, I'll take that question. Um, the best way is to you know, the, the reason why I am, as well as my brothers and sisters at the table, are, 
that we're as effective as we are is because we come from the street. You know, we were once part of the problem, and now we're, you know, part of the active solution. And and we're credible messengers, you know, when, and it makes a really big difference in our high-risk youth. And if, if I go and I speak to a young guy and girl about the streets, you know, there's a certain lingo, there's a certain, you know, uh, energy that comes with that, that they can say, you know what, she's been where I am now or where I'm on my way. So being a credible messenger, uh, it really helps my effectiveness. For someone that has not been um, a part of the street, a part of the history of, I just, you know, I strongly suggest to um, see where you can fit in and, um, you know, hear one of the things that I understand that uh, we're trying to do is to get uh, ceasefire Columbus up and running and to, to fit in an outreach and and find resources for these young guys and girls to you know I and mean, if you're in the clergy department to open up your churches you know after Sunday at 11 o'clock in the morning you know a Saturday on the afternoon and if you have computers or ping pong tables or and if that particular guy and girl that's not part of your congregation welcome them in without being judgmental of because you did this you're bound to go to hell or you know just to understand that because of situations and circumstances of their lives they may not have been uh, exposed to some of the things that your group of uh, youth in your congregation have been exposed to uh, or not. So, uh, and it's also uh, wonderful to have in front of me a voting block that you can go to and get involved, you know, in the legislature of Columbus to, to say, look, I want ceasefire Columbus here you know, the, the violence here and, and understanding the population of what's going on in Columbus, it's it's huge to you guys because we come from a, a, a bigger city and uh, 78, 72 homicides is huge. But for me, and to look at the model and for us to utilize the model here is a great opportunity to get in on the preventive end. So you can stop it right now and get in on the preventive end to make it work, to be a success story of Columbus that because of Deanne Wilson and Tammy and, and the team of uh, Ceasefire Columbus and the superintendent of public schools here um, bought into the campaign of the model that Ceasefire Illinois offers, it is phenomenal to start now to get that on the preventive end. So that's how 